Hi, Nina. Where in the world are you today? Hey, Boomer. I'm in London. All right. So London, and we don't know when this is going to get released exactly, but sort of mid-2021, you've had quite a interesting lockdown experience, which is reportedly getting, you know, I guess opened up a little bit in the next couple of weeks. Where do you plan to go? Oh, well, anywhere but here. <laughs> 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 oh, you mean London is like, it, it's funny because London in the summer is actually quite beautiful. Um, but I can understand if you've been there for quite a while, it's uh, it's a little difficult. No, right? it, it, London is great, uh, but it has been, uh, you know, year and a half in constant lockdown. So you do desire to go somewhere else. Right? Getting the itch to get on a plane, are you? Exactly. That's it. <laughs> so as much as I want to talk about those destinations, I do want to get into today a little bit about, of course, glycans. Now, one of the um, troubles I've always had in explaining my glycan age test to people, but also uh, what glycans are to others is just like, what are glycans exactly? And I would love to just hear straight from the expert. So Nina, how do we explain glycans to people? That's one of those key challenges we have, because if even if you explain what a glycan is and you explain it as a sugar, people still think it's, or they would still associate with the sugars we eat. So maybe they would think about glucose or they would think about sugars they know, but very few of us actually know that sugars are a key component of all of our cells. So since we have multicellular organisms, they're all, uh, all the proteins are glycosylated. So they're, uh, and they, are very important is making us individually unique. And one of the ways they do know they're important is ABO blood, blood groups. So the glycans and blood cells decide your blood group. And if they can decide your blood group, then you can imagine how important they are in all other processes. But the difference is sugars, yes, we eat them, but we also have them as a core component of our biology. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was much simpler than the explanation I was thinking of. <laughs> like, uh, that's that's great. And so, uh, when we talk about just sort of testing glycans, because, uh, and we're going to get in a little bit today in this whole idea of biological age. And you know, when we test glycans, I always, and and this is not an implication on glycans or anything. I always have to ask the question about how much do we know and how verifiable are the accuracy of these tests, right? Because if you think about uh, some something like Theranos back in the day, right? They couldn't get the vitamin D test right and like something like 60% of the time. So how accurate are, are is our ability to test glycans these days? So that's one of our key advantages mm -hmm. in the research lab. And it, the, uh, the lab that invented us is also the core analytical lab of the Human Glycan Project. Mm -hmm. so we have this large data set of over 150,000 people, some which were followed in biobanks for 20, 30 years. So we not, not just that we know how glycans change with age, but we know how they change within an individual person with age. And all of this is public, it's published. Even our methodology that we use on these uh, dry blood stains, which is the commercial uh, glycan kit, um, is published and peer reviewed, where we uh, show that they can be stable in the post up to two weeks. So that we can also do research on it, not just that we can claim it as a commercial company, but we can, you can use the same type of analysis for rigid scientific research. And the accuracy in terms of chronological age, because that's the biggest confusion. So if you talk about, biological age, a lot of the, uh, well, just to uh, put this into perspective as well. So we first uh, developed the clock around 2010 and we published it in 2013. And then Horvath's clock or the epigenetic clock was published sometimes 2014. Yeah. So we actually came before Horvath's clock. Mm -hmm. Our first application for it or the idea was actually forensics to because we saw they change a lot with age and we tried to use them to identify if we can tell the age of a person, and then if this is a crime scene, you want to know if that's a young uh, person or an experienced criminal. Mm -hmm. And that they were not, well, they were most accurate to what we knew then, but they were not very accurate because our variability from chronological age 
is about nine years. Mm -hmm. And if you compare this to DNA methylation, their variability is a couple years or two plus minus yeah. two years. But the difference is that we are uh, we see biological age, which you can explain by also looking at, uh, well, in the scientific papers, other parameters, so other blood markers, BMI, uh, other elements which tell if a person is healthy or unhealthy. And um, with epigenetic or DNA methylation, it can be just explained by age. So if you know the age of a person, you can explain the clock or you can explain the age. Yeah, so it, when I was kind of delving into this with... Uh a professor at Stanford. My understanding of Horvath's clock is that because it has a 90 plus percent correlation to chronological age, probably the most relevant case for it is for that forensic evidence. Um, and what I'm really excited today to delve into you with is because there's slight differential um, with glycan age um, or with glycans is that how we can use this as people who are looking to practice longevity in a way, because if you think about like the art of practicing longevity, you're doing all this stuff today to really hope that someday in the future, you just don't drop down and die faster than you would like. Right. Um, and I would love to just get into some of the, I guess, lifestyle implication or lifestyle choices that we can make and their implications on glycans. Because when I'm looking at, for either me or for some of the clients that I have, a, a metric that can measure uh, the success of lifestyle modifications, Horvath's clock becomes a little bit more of a, a blur because it's so correlated with chronological age. And so when it comes to glycans, uh, what are some of the, the things that affect glycans? You mentioned BMI earlier, but what are some of the other effects as well? So that's one of the, that's one key advantage is that we saw this big difference and it wasn't just from, we understood that that's some type of biological age. Mm -hmm. What type is the, the second part of it. Uh, explaining also what type of glycans we look at. We you look at glycans on your immune uh, antibodies and they regulate inflammation. So based on what type of glycans you have on these immunoglobulin G antibodies, they would uh, be more pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory. And we would see that with aging, they change, their composition changes of being more pro-inflammatory and less of the good anti-inflammatory ones. And this also, uh, inflammation is also one of the key drivers of chronic conditions where we, our immune system basically attacks our own tissue for whichever reasons, and we all break in different places. Uh, so when you're talking about longevity, it's not just about how long you're going to live, you want to live healthy. So in a way, it doesn't matter if you're going to live an extra 20, 30 years in poor health, you want more years where you will- Yeah, I don't want to be in a hospital, right? Like sitting 20 to 30 years in a hospital bed, I have zero interest in that. We're really good at <laughs> keeping people alive sometimes, but mm -hmm. it, it has to be good quality of life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you mentioned uh, the immune system and inflammation as being, and, and that is sort of one of those uh, those hallmarks of of disease, if you will. And you know, I guess, what are some of the other areas that we can observe with the glycans? Uh, I know that there's certain ones that we can observe more in a research laboratory versus with a, a commercially available test, but I'd love to just kind of go through some of those verticals, if you will. So the obvious one is BMI, and mm -hmm. that's what we validated both on accelerated or higher BMI has a, a accelerates your aging, lower BMI, you age slower or healthy BMI, you age slower. And we also did um, weight loss intervention and bariatric surgery, which then reversed the glycan clock within six months post-surgery. These are obese individuals who lose 20, 30 kilograms in a very short period of time. So it's a, it's a little bit extreme. Um, then we looked at diet. So we thought, is there a particular diet? Because we know weight loss works and we all follow particular diets to achieve the same goal. Is there a diet that works better than others? And that's something that's going to be published in two weeks um, where we looked at the thousand- Ooh, any, any sort of hints that you can give us? 
a little bit, but I'll share it when it's out. Uh, it was a mixture of uh, both low carb, high carb, high protein, um, high fat, low fat. Um, and we saw that exactly, and, and this was a, a thousand people followed over six months. We saw that in every of these Thai categories, half people benefit, half people don't. So we're actually really unique in terms of what diet works for us. And we can't yet tell you in advance which of these diets will work for your longevity or your uh, glycan aging or immune aging, but you can test it. So you can try a certain diet for a three month period and you will see a response in your glycan age, which could be positive or negative. It can correlate with BMI, but it can also correlate with things which you can see. And one of those is um, triglycerides. So a lot of people, go for a keto diet and for some people they really do well on it or, or maybe there's different types of keto and maybe it's also different for different people but for some they could be a super fit healthy individual but they could have high um, fat markers which we know are not good for your health mm -hmm. uh, and glycanase would affect this as well mm -hmm. so uh, specific biomarkers uh, well BMI, BMI would be a calculation but specific biomarkers triglycerides would have more or higher triglycerides having a link with higher glycan age do I have that right yes okay are there other particular markers that you guys have noticed that have general correlations with uh, a higher glycan age level so in that first study in 2013, we looked at, um, and I don't know all of them on top of my head, but there was mm -hmm. about 25 different biomarkers. Mm -hmm. that insulin resistance, glucose, HbA1c, bad cholesterol, uh, triglycerides, waist size, BMI, and a number of others, uh, calcium as well. And all of these correlated with a higher glycan age. So we can explain this variability of why somebody has a higher older or younger glycan age by looking at those biomarkers and we need, we can explain up to 70 percent of the variability and back then we were comparing it to telomeres so we compared it to the telomere studies where they can explain 15 to 20 percent of the var variability oh, wow. and we can explain a lot more of it by having more knowledge but another aspect uh, of these glycans is that sometimes they change before these things happen so we have these other biomarkers we're developing for uh, prevention or prognostic uh, for diabetes and cardiovascular events, where, for example, in diabetes, they'll change, the glycans would change 10 years before you have a high HbA1c or you have this dysregulated glucose. So they would, you wouldn't be able to run the traditional blood tests and identify the problem because the glycan is changing before that's happening. So that's very interesting. Uh, and diabetes, obviously, I'm closer to the cardiac side of things. But uh, when it comes to diabetes, and you're saying that we noticed shifts in glycans that are around about 10 years beforehand. So let's say I'm a 20 year old, and I'm just eating garbage, because 20 year olds can eat garbage, right? Uh, you generally will see a shift towards something that could be like, pro-diabetic as soon as 10 years beforehand. That's incredible. So we can identify particular glycan pa uh, patterns, which all have this chronic inflammation trait, but we can make them specific. So that's a whole, cause it's not um, like one molecule, it's a whole group of different ones. And we can, uh, you know, all of them have a certain meaning and mechanism and we're learning all about it. So uh, just real quick, because you mentioned chronic inflammation and the, the markers that I think of traditionally as chronic inflammation would be something like high sensitivity C-reactive protein. Does this mean, and if you're not able to comment on this, I completely understand, but does this mean that a glycan, these groups of glycans can be predictive of higher inflammatory states, even if the HSCRP is sort of steady state uh, lower, if you will? Sometimes it correlates, but yeah. also, yes. Also, yes, we do not. I think we maybe in one exercise paper, we have uh, CRP and a bunch of others uh, and glycans were more sensitive or they were shown to be more sensitive. And there's a big difference between the low grade chronic inflammation and acute inflammation. So yeah. CRP is still acute inflammation. You can change within a couple of days. Um, of something going wrong. With glycans, they have a long half-life. So you always see this average over a prolonged period of time that also mimics aging or follows aging in a very precise way. 
Very cool. Very cool. Um, can, you mentioned the uh, twenty-year-olds eating junk food. I can tell you a fun story. Let's hear a fun story about twenty-year-olds eating junk food. Well, because I bet everybody listening to this, which is they were twenty years old and <laughs> could talk to their twenty-year-old self and say, "Don't eat the junk food." Yeah, I think a lot of us make the mistake, and I think <laughs> I, I could say I was one uh, a long time ago now. Um, but we did a software development company. Uh, with 35 engineers, we tested all of them. They took like a corporate program mm -hmm. and they were all guys in their twenties, you know, they were mainly barely 30. Some of them were high BMI, others were actually quite skinny and all of them came back 10, 20 years older. So we, they even joked about it. We call them senior engineers or senior wow. developers, but they all had the same environment and same habits. So they would literally for breakfast, it was cereal for lunch. It was cereal or it was junk food. Uh, and even so, have, so refined carbohydrates do a number on your glycans huh? a lot of people are sensitive not all you had some interesting studies now showing that some people are completely they can tolerate them really well mm -hmm. uh, but for them there's so many different things so it's not just the carbs it's the processed fats and they had something they called a salad where they put chips and popcorn any leftovers in the office it, it was insane it's quite um, the salad <laughs> <laughs> there was a salad and in the evening they just had they had beer as a culture so there was lots of these unhealthy habits and you also can change them overnight uh, but we had a nutritionist work with them and she implemented little things in their work that, so basically they would have a work task and another one would be you know eat the cereal but add some oatmeal or <laughs> add, you know little changes to get there and we had some high adopters so we had some who really made a big change so from exercise to really radically changing their diet and not coming to the office as much but cooking at home and we had them uh, one of them reverse 10 years within six months wow the ones who didn't change didn't reverse it was so interesting that the environment doesn't matter you know what size there were it had a similar input impact on all of them there was literally one guy uh, who had a good result who was an ex-sportsman and had a bit uh, better habits than the others so when, wow, where do I want to go from here? There's uh, there's so many questions that I could ask around this. So when I'm, let's let's go down the clinician route uh, because this is uh, fascinating to me because you and I have exchanged messages many times on this. We look at the that biological age world, and there are dozens of tests out there, right? And there's. 20 different interpretations of Horvath's clock, even though one company owns the IP. So it's impossible to have 20 different, different interpretations. There's, there's telomere age, as you've mentioned, there's glycan age. And, you know, as, as a clinician, you know, we want to set up benchmarks for our clients, right? You want to understand what is working and what's not, and then make adjustments on the fly. Uh, Horvath's clock seems to be, you don't really get to see as much of the adjustment, at least in my experience, um, as much of the adjustment, certain adjustments uh, within six months time period, it's usually a longer term. Uh, how would you, you know, and I know you guys do work with clinicians, how would you have people set up experiments with and I say experiments in quotes, uh, benchmarking with their clients uh, so that they can start to track some of these lifestyle modifications that they're suggesting. And what's the sort of appropriate time frame in between tests? So the half-life of uh, these glycans is three to five weeks, but let's say three weeks. So when we do research, the minimum we would want to have samples is about six, eight weeks, and that's the bare minimum, and they would need to be a very significant intervention. Uh, commercially, we say three months. After, mm -hmm. you can also see uh, a bit of a change, but three months is more optimal, and within six months, you can really see a dramatic change. So you can see a 10-year drop, a 20-year drop, mm -hmm. and the intervention. And some are really predictable. So with weight loss, it's quite predictable, unless you're overtraining. So if you're piling on top... Uh, that low, uh, so caloric uh, deficiency on top of intensive exercise, then that's double the stress in the body and it would rebel and have the opposite 
uh, effect. Mm -hmm. What a lot of people do when they go and lose weight. So it's a nice way to see if you're achieving that sustainably. And what we see is doing one by one work. So if you're just focusing on exercise and then recovering, that has a positive effect. If you're just dieting and recovering, it has a positive effect. Um, some things that you can do in clinic that we can't do commercially that work really well are also quite interesting and they're quite predictable. And one of them is hormone optimization. Okay. So doing something like a TRT or hormone balancing kind of exercise. There's quite a science to it. And we actually, it wasn't a big focus area of our research until we started doing something with menopause this year, but maybe 2017, we got a samples of 600 people that were collected about 20 years ago. And there were some intervention studies where hormones were knocked off, both in men and women. And we had a, a cohort of 36, year, uh, 36 young women who were with another hormone knocked off gondola hormones and half were in placebo, half on estrogen patches. We saw the placebo age nine years within five months while the estrogen patches didn't age or they stayed in the same range. Uh, and it's actually something similar we see in the transition phase to menopause. With men also, they were knocked off testosterone for 12 weeks and then half were given uh, testosterone, half were given testosterone with an aromatized inhibitor to block its conversion to estrogen. Yeah. We saw that the ones who were giving uh, just testosterone had a positive change or they... Uh, didn't have the negative, um, didn't change in a negative way. And the ones which got the inhibitor had a negative change. So it's actually the conversion of uh, testosterone to estrogen that benefits men as well. And there, I, I was quite excited. There was a mice study in, done uh, a few months ago where uh, in this, uh, I forgot the name of the aging institute, but it's one of the ones in the US where they gave the mice this non-feminizing um, beta uh, 17 estradiol and they extended the lifespan of the mice by 20% the male mice which was the strongest longevity drug in mice tested so far apart from this other telomer drug that just came out um, mm -hmm. they extended by 40% so our best longevity drug for mice that we knew until a month ago was estrogen wow Okay, so this kind of would go contrary to what a lot of people would think in terms of aromatase inhibitors and packing on more muscle with testosterone, et cetera. And so, I mean, is there a, and, and maybe we don't have this level of data yet, but is there a certain amount of data that's sort of dose dependent, meaning that um, can you have too much estrogen, in which case I know a number of those metabolite pathways, and one of those can potentially lead to cancer or DNA damage, right? Um, is there a certain level of estrogen that becomes like, hey, too much, and then your glycans get affected, or do we not know yet? yet? There's lots of different types of estrogen, for yeah. one, and there's definitely a type and dose difference. So that's a, I think going into this Similar, the research in men is similar to women where they may dismiss assumptions that the testosterone will cause prostate cancer, mm -hmm. which validated it, it doesn't. Um, same was done for women and even on a higher scale, there was a WHI study in the US uh, 20 years ago that was cost a lot of money and it was a financial crisis and they didn't see any benefit because they introduced it into women who are 10 years post menopause and it was the HRT back in the day, which was made from pregnant horses urine. And although it was the same type of progestogen we have in the contraceptive pill, and also the estrogen only didn't have an increased risk of breast cancer, but the combined one uh, had a small increased risk. So it was 1.26% increased risk. And if you're comparing this to smoking, for example, smoking is a 27.9 increased risk uh, of cancer. So it's not statistically significant. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of um, This is when people go and manipulate data and it drives me freaking nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and that caused a big scandal because a lot of women went off HRT. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of lawsuits. 
And there was even a clinician who now correlated it with increased risk of Alzheimer's cases, which is mainly a woman's disease. 65% of Alzheimer patients are women. So we do know that it has lots of protective properties and it's in a way, if you look at the immune system, it has an anti-inflammatory property. And that's what we see in pregnancies as well. But also for men, it protects the immune system, it protects their brain. Um, so it's an interesting space of debate, but in the in in now already uh, at least twenty clinical practices, we see predictable results a couple months post therapy, and they, all of it now is body identical or the same molecules as we produce. So the estrogen is made from wild yams, so it's a different type of drug than it was twenty years ago. And people would basically say, same as with aging, menopause is natural; you shouldn't treat it. it, it but it's same as with aging, it's the inflection point of many different diseases. And unless uh -huh. you treat that as a hormone deficiency, then you're exposing yourself to a lot of other uh, complications that come later on. Um, so it's a taboo space. And we do see dose differences. So we're comparing private or in the UK NHS and no, uh, public or NHS in UK and private. Uh -huh. And there's dose difference in a way that in private, they would optimize it more, they'll be more responsive to symptoms and uh, what you're reporting, while in um, NHS, they would be the lowest or the you know smallest dose for the shortest period of time, and they wouldn't see as much benefit. Uh -huh. There's definitely a dose, and there's not an estrogen bias, so I thought that there, we could have an estrogen bias, and that's a big space of um, uh, interest, but we actually see the people who have a uh, uh, like a condition connected to it, like endometriosis, would have a negative result. Uh -huh. So it all comes back to balance. If, if you're looking at uh, the immune system inflammation, it's the right level of balance, not too much, not too little, uh, which is always hard to get to. This is fascinating. As a person who's looked at sort of the network of hormones and, you know, when you're able to balance them, what it does to a human in terms of performance, um, I, I'm guessing that would all be captured within a glycan age test, right? So if I were to have a balanced network of hormones and as a result, less inflammation, uh, that would serve as a net benefit rather than just, let's say, going with testosterone and raising the hell out of that. Uh, it's probably better, as we say, to balance the network. Is that, do I have that right? Absolutely. I think what, what with the first research we did, where it was a, um knocked out and like a hysterectomy well i'm sorry I'm really talking just about women but in a way you control it uh -huh. with natural aging or menopause or menopause different hormones decline at a different pace so you yeah. have to optimize it to that person it's not a standard protocol it's really a little bit of an art uh, combined with the science very cool you mentioned endometriosis and so um one of the difficult areas for a lot of clinicians can be around autoimmune conditions. Um, and, and since you have mentioned endometriosis and its net impact, can we, I mean, maybe this hasn't been done yet, but like, can you use glycans as sort of a predictor of potential autoimmune risk in people? And do you have clinicians that do that? That's something we don't do commercially, but that's definitely their potential. So we very much focused our, our research on the big diseases like uh, diabetes, cardiovascular, and that was a topic of taking it to further stages. But we have identified some glycans which are caused in autoimmune thyroid disease. Mm -hmm. They do play an important part, and you can probably stratify them, same as we do for cardiovascular disease, to different autoimmune conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess I would love at some point for these tests to be commercially available. I understand all of the hurdles that you have to go through to get something that's closer to a diagnostic test to be available. But, um, and you can tell me, Nina, if you're not allowed to comment, but in terms of how these tests would work uh, with let's say an autoimmune condition, you would observe, is it observing a particular glycan pattern that is uh, kind of common within, you said thyroid, so Hashimoto's or Graves, um, and then being able to 
recommend lifestyle changes before it becomes an issue or are you kind of noticing it as it becomes an issue because you know earlier you mentioned something about diabetes being sort of 10 years out predictable um, what what it is to the extent like how how much of a minority report type situation can we get into here like how fat how quickly can we predict this stuff so i would i would guess before but that research needs to be done, or at least I haven't read it yet. Mm -hmm. um, one interesting thing, and then this was the first, I think, um, uh, diagnostic application about 30 years ago was for arthritis, where they saw the glycans change 10 years before. So I would assume that in most conditions, they would actually change before and you would have a warning. One challenge we have with diabetes now is can you prevent it? So we're doing early intervention studies to see if you can actually impact it with lifestyle or early pharmacology to actually not have that happen. So, because that's the other part, if you're going to tell something, something's going to happen, you may yeah. as well, you know, be able to give them some action steps on how to prevent it. Uh, otherwise, you, you're causing some anxiety and you, you don't have a solution for them. Exactly. And it's just, but with something like a type two diabetes, I imagine that you can do and I'm simplifying things, but like lifestyle interventions here, generally speaking, work uh, both in the form of diet and, and you know, drink selection in certain cases, uh, lifestyle modifications, etc. But I guess adherence is probably the biggest issue. And I, I'm, I'm very curious when those studies come out, I would love to hear if you're able to divert somebody that soon um, or provide the wake up call because out of all these biological age, and I, I love glycan age, but like of all these biological age, I find this rumored grim age uh, to be very interesting. And I know one of the things you can do with glycans is potentially predict a cardiac event. Uh, but these are all tests that tend to scare people. And as a result, I'm guessing that the regulatory authorities don't necessarily want people releasing that onto the market to uh, put maybe unnecessary fears into those that that take them or maybe necessary fears uh, so it's a, it's a very fascinating space yeah there's lots of regulatory hurdles in any uh, disease specific claims grim uh, grim age is fascinating i we don't have a mortality clock but it's uh, fascinating uh, what steve's done and we're actually doing some collaboration with steve so i can tell you much about it but we will uh, we will look at some of his cohort and um, we'll, we'll do something together. Um, I think it's a, absolutely, it has a, like an application or a practice. Um, there was one, that, it's actually a shame they didn't do Grim Age, but there was one review paper um, done with 10 different clocks and they use something called clinic, uh, clinomics, which is a combination of all the clinical markers. Mm -hmm. Uh, to proteomics, to lipidomics, to DNA methylation, and glycomics, because we analyzed there. Uh, there was a Scottish biobank and Estonian biobank. And they looked at relevant towards disease outcomes, or what is the clinical relevance of them. And they, uh, one thing they managed to prove that we actually haven't done yet, uh, they, we knew before that certain levels of glycans correlate with cardiovascular and diabetes, mm -hmm. but we didn't know how the acceleration of a glycan age clock correlates uh, with incidence of future disease, and they actually managed to prove it. So acceleration, uh, acceleration of the clock correlated with hospital admissions and future cases of incident disease. So it is a prognostic market, but it's very broad. It can be lots of different things. So now the challenge of expanding it in the future is giving those specific signatures so you know what will go wrong. So by acceleration, uh, just so we define it for people, what we're talking about here is let's say my chronological age is 35, my glycan age is 35. Uh, it's not, and we'll get into that in a second, but let's say a year down the line, if my chronological age is 36 and then my glycan age would be something like 38, that's what we mean by acceleration, right? Is it, it's not just like the one for one trading off of, right? Well, they actually calculate as one above your chronological age. So okay. Even say as an average 10 above or the, as the average can vary nine up or down, we say that if it's a little bit above you're, you're still in the average range 
Mm -hmm. Most people fit into the average range. Nina, you and I run in some of the same circles. And so I'm kind of curious, like of this kind of health optimization, biohacker longevity crowd, if there's any kind of interventions that you've seen that have worked well uh, when it comes to glycans, either with yourself or with other people that you spoke to? I do think that most of it doesn't have enough evidence yet. We're very keen to learn more. Mm -hmm. And one that comes up a lot in our clients is uh, fasting. Mm -hmm. And we've seen it do both good and bad. We may even see a gender difference. We did have a number of women who had a negative change from it. So that's one thing we're doing a proper trial with now with one of the, uh, one of the clinicians we uh, collaborate with, and he's doing 40 uh, people. And I actually have to check if it's both men and women, because a lot of times they try to avoid the woman uh, mm -hmm. uh, on fasting. And that'll be interesting to see, because that's one thing that everybody now does for longevity. It's the magic thing to do, but mm -hmm. stress, same as any other stress. And if you overdo the stress, then you can have the negative side effects on that too. One very interesting is uh, cold therapy. Wow. And that's just clients who do it or who've had a good score, who had this in practice, and it's pretty common. And that's also stress in the body, but it's intermittent, very short-term stress. Mm -hmm. And that seems to work in a good way because um, it activates our own mechanism to regenerate. So having these little shocks is actually good for us, but the balance is really important. And I think with that, you can easily get the right balance, and, you know, unless you're going to be swimming in a cold lake for an hour. Maybe that's a little bit over the top. <laughs> Uh, if you black out in the cold in the winter, that's probably not good. Um, but it, there's, look, there's a laundry list of sort of these longevity supplements, medicines, whatever you want to call that I would love to see what they do to glycans. Uh, but, you know, maybe that's something that'll happen over time. Yeah, we don't have any conclusive evidence yet, but we haven't had many trials. Mm -hmm. I've had clients try NAD boosters, lots of, and we even had some like a pilot where we did see some significant changes, but only in a few people and the others we didn't. And maybe the trial was too short. So that, that was one, that's one of the assumptions, but we really want to properly look at them because unless you're doing something that's placebo controlled, you always have the placebo effect as well. Of course. Yeah. And yeah. so anything you're paying a lot of money for will probably, you know, just based on our psychology, have a little bit of a positive impact and would, that can impact your glycan age as well. I want to go through my results if it's okay. And just to give people, and if you're tuning into the YouTube video right now, you can see the tests. Um, I'll put the test in the show notes as well, uh, test results. But if it's okay, I'll share my screen Nina, and we can just go through these and you can kind of tell people a little bit about what I am able to learn about myself sort of in this lovely, uh, this lovely test. And so here's me in a nutshell. What can we, uh, what can we surmise out of this, Nina? So your score is the optimal one. Our optimal score is 20. Uh, so you're 15 years younger. And that's what we do see is that because the people who care about their health are usually healthy already. So we see a little bit of this um, positive health bias, even in our consumers. Uh, we wish we had more of the ones who had a poor result because there'll be more room for improvement. Mm -hmm. The only thing you can do is optimize the indexes. Mm -hmm. If you scroll down, you'll see uh, free indexes, which are actually categories. So we from your IgG, we extract these um, 27 different glycans, and then we put them in two features as an analogy. And one of them is the glycan mature, or all the ones we label as bad or pro-inflammatory. And then the other two are glycan health and youth, which we label as good or anti-inflammatory. And you have a really good balance. Mm -hmm. Of both, you're actually in the 88 and 92 percentile. So your percentiles are better than mine because I'm also 20, but I don't have as good percentiles as you. <laughs> so, but as you said, there's still 
even though I've, I've got a good score, there's still some things that I can work on. And I do think with these tests, there is a tendency that people that are healthy are the ones that buy them. <laughs> and so, as you mentioned before, that sort of positive health bias, but even here, I can look at this and say, well, yeah, I'm an 80th percentile, but I wasn't a B student. I want to be an A student. And so there's, there's some work that I can do. Uh, this yeah. is, I mean, it's very fascinating. Uh, one of the things, and I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen now, but in terms of the responsiveness, you've mentioned three months. Uh, if somebody were to be sort of one of these um, health optimizers, if you will, is the ideal cadence three months or six months, or does it really just depend on how frequently you change your interventions? It really depends on the intervention. And if it's <laughs> drug, sometimes we see really um, significant impact within two, three months. Mm -hmm. A lot of customers who trial metformin. Yeah. They can see, but a lot of them also have the uh, vulnerability or they would have their, you know, they wouldn't be diabetic or pre-diabetic, but if they would have a continuous glucose monitors, they would have a really big spike uh, with certain foods. So it could be that it's the, um, them as an individual or the bias towards it rather than metformin as a drug, because that's a big trial that everybody's waiting for the results for. Of course. If it's exercise, you can also do a lot of damage pretty quickly mm -hmm. and some of it can accumulate. So we work with athletes in a different way where we analyze them a little bit more frequently and they can, they, if they're really intensively training, you can see about an average of a five-year spike within three months, but they are wow. training to compete. So they're, they're knowingly doing damage. And then we see them recover about three months after. Uh, and it's a good way to measure that recovery. And with professional athletes, we generally see them older unless they're doing regenerative medicine, stem cells and different modern ways to do that now. Mm -hmm. And some of it stays post-retirement. So if we're looking at a professional soccer player or a football player, he's about 10, 15 years older, like, like an age on average, and he's fixed at that. So every year if you're measuring, he's gonna stay at that unless he does an intervention. So it's a nice way to look at sports. And a lot of the health optimizers also do a lot of intensive sports. Mm -hmm. So if you have a good score, I would say if you're doing something really intensive, you want to measure if that's causing damage. And you could be really resilient where you just get the good score throughout, but you could see a significant change if you push yourself a little bit too far. So, and I mean... It really depends a lot on periodization, right? But if my periodization for new experiments is every three months, then perhaps I want an every three month glycanage. Uh, if my periodization is more like six months or I just happen to retest everything every six months and that just works for me, then that could work as well. Um, it seems like there's plenty of options here, that's for sure. Plenty of options. And if you're just looking at aging and you have a good score, then once a year is perfect. Yeah or even less frequent, but you would measure it to see how your aging is doing. And then if you had something significant happen, you may want to see the impact of that, but it really should be customized to uh, your experience. And we do sometimes recommend around your birthday. Uh, yeah, it's usually, that's a, a good selling point for clients in general, right? Uh, so uh, Nina, what's the future of glycanage look like? Anything new coming out soon? The most new thing is a novel uh, molecular diagnostics for perimenopause and menopause. So I, we knew nothing about this and I, well, we knew nothing about, I knew nothing about perimenopause a year ago. Uh, and our whole um, team, we, we saw that something around menopause was, there was a gender difference in aging. Uh, but when, when we went to the market, we realized it's actually changes way before menopause happens. And then we realize most of these women don't know that this is connected to menopause because they still have their cycle. And they can you can still have your cycle for four, uh, average of four years, but up to 10 years. So you can spend a decade experiencing all kinds of symptoms from depression, anxiety, being misdiagnosed with fibromyalgia or all kinds of other actually inflammatory symptoms. Uh -huh and have the wrong diagnosis or take the wrong drug. You even had the celebrities like the director of Vogue and Oprah being misdiagnosed. They would have heart palpitations. They would go to the best doctors. They would 
do all the tests, they wouldn't find a problem, they will still find, give them the medication because they have the symptom until they realize that this could be menopause connected. So you don't have any current molecular diagnostics for menopause. And the last uh, attempt or the uh, last uh, diagnostic application was the FSH test, which was invented in the 1940s. Wow. And this from Merck. So you haven't had innovation, you know, in, in a long period of time. Uh, so it's, I think it's a very huge unmet need. Mm -hmm. 1.2 billion women globally entering menopause in 2025. And most of them don't know when it's going to happen and they don't associate the symptoms. And there is a taboo as well. So it's something that you maybe discreetly want to buy or test, but you may not. Uh, want to share it with your friends or yeah of course but for yeah, yeah carry on oh very, that's very cool i'm i'm really excited to see that come on market yeah i think it meets a really large unmet need mm -hmm. and that, um, we have other biomarkers which are in different stages of development mainly focusing on cardiovascular and diabetes and we <laughs> In this last study, we actually managed to associate the cardio markers also with menopause. And it's very different to men and women. In women, it was one glycan that was more predictive uh, than even the uh, German AHA risk score. For men, it was the opposite. There was a complete different cohort of glycans. So it is, there's lots of gender difference. There's, you know, uh, population to population. So it's really something that has to be customized and keep in mind that your score, uh, even looking at your score, about half of it, or depending on the glycan, the influence is 30 to 50 percent your genes, and the rest is in behavior and environment. So a lot of that is individual in a way. Um, but it will really be specific. So we'll give you an aging score for women. Now we can give them a menopause one very soon, a cardio one, and for men as well, we can give them scores or we can give them predictions on what way they'll break in 10 years time. And then if you make a change, it will also respond to that change. So you can measure if that change is get, leading to a positive outcome or if it's even causing you more da damage or not helping you. Nina, I didn't tell you this before, but now we're gonna transition into our final four questions here. And these are kind of rapid fire. I ask them of everybody, uh, but what is your top trick for enhancing focus? Ooh, meditating. For sure. And taking time out. So what type of meditation do you use? I do Vipassana mm. I did a bunch of their like a 10 day sound retreat and it's uh, based on sensations. It's not verbal or it's not just clear your mind. It's more observing your body. Very cool. Uh, book, which has most significantly impacted your life. I read so many. I don't know if I can pull one for you. I can probably pull. You can, you can do top three or just start rattling them off and I'll cut you off at some point. <laughs> top three? Um, well, I loved one cancer researcher's book recently called The First Cell. Mm -hmm. He also identified a problem that the mice research just wasn't converting to humans and it's a huge waste of resources and the cancer field, field hasn't moved much in the last uh, five decades or more. And that we need biomarkers for early diagnostics. And that's really where it makes sense. But it was a very powerful book with lots of personal stories um, of her being a clinician, then collecting her own biobank, because uh, nobody else was doing it, of uh, 60,000 samples for more than 6,000 of her patients. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that book. Uh, and I also love the book from. Um, well, a, a British lady who was originally Jewish called Let It Go. She was an entrepreneur in the 1960s, I think so, or I actually wouldn't be sure, but she was one of the early, um, uh, they, they were called freelance programmers. She mm -hmm. built a business on women programming from home and it was back, you know, you typed in the card and then that got yeah. somewhere <laughs> And they built it to a five billion company. And she started from nothing. She started on her kitchen table, um, you know, when she had to quit her job to have a child. So it was a, I, I love that book as well. But you notice I like the female team. So I think. Very cool. And the third one, I loved him, Paris. Uh, I loved his um, uh, four hour work week. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mainly loved his writing style. He just 
spoke and wrote in a way that was approachable to lots of people. It's very casual, right? So it's, it's um, very casual. and I can go for more books if you like. <laughs> let's uh, let's go with the. I guess the, the, the fourth question is kind of easy, but the third one, uh, what excites you most about the health world right now? Um, I like the focus on longevity because that's really health prevention and there's a big movement towards that. My only, it, and that excites me because we're really moving towards optimizing functional decline instead of waiting until something happens and then being reactive. So I see huge potential there. What worries me a little bit is the lack of diversity, gender, and ethnic. So I, I see that lots of people wouldn't associate with what's going on because they're not included. So I would like that to be expanded a bit more so you can have broader reach. Well said. Nina, this has been a lot of fun. And I know I'm going to bump into you at some point, whether it's while you're escaping your lockdown or some other place, but where can people find out more about you and what you're up to with Glycan Age? I'm not very big on social, but I do use LinkedIn. Um, and I would go on our Glycan Age Instagram. Um, a lot of times I help with the post or I help with the themes. So I think, and I, always somebody is there to help answer comments and, and response. I think that's a good, and we do a lot of this education or finding little snippets from different papers and explaining what it means and what it says. So I would say Instagram is good. Very cool. We'll link to all of this in the show notes, but uh, Nina, I get really excited to talk about benchmarking and obviously I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you today. So thank you for taking the time and explaining to us, uh, really debunking a lot of what's going on in the biological age world, because I know uh, as a person who's in this, that it can be very confusing sometimes. So thank you so much for your time today. You're welcome. I hope it was simple enough. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. To all the superhumans listening out there, have an epic day.